So please join me in welcoming uh, Ben Morris from Google. Oh. I was rated highly, really. I like your microphone over here, too. Yeah, mic up. Can you guys hear me over here? I thought I was going to say, well, all because we had the lowest rated speaker of all time, a straight 0, 0.0 all the way around. So I'm glad he didn't tell you guys the truth about my readings. Uh, so uh, it's good to be here. My name is Ben Morse, as you said. I'm a developer advocate here at Google. I don't have a lanyard. Afterwards, afterwards, they were saying, you shouldn't go in here. You're not part of this event. I said, really? I'm speaking. Let me in the event, please. So let me in, finally. And here I am. So uh, this is about AMP and the web and how they work together increasingly in various kinds of ways. Uh, as I said, I work at Google. I'm a developer advocate over here. I used to be a musician for a long time. I didn't program for some years. And when I came back to programming, my first full-time job was at the New York Times. So I'm a big fan of publishing. I love newspapers and great writing. And I just feel honored to be able to speak to you today. And whatever we can do to chat about afterwards, please let me know. The basic idea of my talk here is we all want to get a better web. The web is pretty good. You know, it can be good. It can be bad. But the goal is for the web to be excellent. And we're in this together. People that have publishing sites, people that have content on the web, and Google, we're in this together. We want it to be easier for users to view your content, for your content to be smoother, to look better, to be better for users, to be a more pleasurable experience. Not just for users also, but for developers also. It should be easier for developers to make good sites. It shouldn't take a lot of work in a large team to make a really good user experience. So users and developers need a better web. And not just on desktop devices, which are already pretty good, but also on mobile devices, which are more challenging. A good responsive site is important, of course. And why couldn't it be as good as an app or better than an app? The web has all the power there that you need for this. It's just not always done. Often sites are too slow. Often there's a lot of stuff that makes sites slower than they have to be. Often on less powerful phones, they don't work that well because JavaScript executes more slowly on less powerful phones, much more slowly in some cases. And uh, in certain regions of the world, connections are much, much slower. You may have heard before that it's still the case that 40% of world connections are on 2G. 60% last year, 40% now is getting better. Uh, you'll get 3G, you'll get 4G in most places in the world, the most major cities, of course, in the US, in Korea, in South Korea, of course. In Western Europe, you'll get nice connections. And in major cities in India and Brazil, you get pretty good 3G, often 4G. But leave those cities, it gets worse. In New York, get on the subway, you know, travel like I do at NJ Transit every day to New Jersey, where I have very little connection. There are places where connections are just kind of bad. And sometimes you can't get a good experience on the web. But often you can, but just sites do things that make it slower. I think you've seen stats before today about how speed matters or why speed matters. I think Matt showed you a couple of these things before. You guys are sophisticated here. I won't dwell on these things. But here's one really important stat about why, though. <laughs> Sorry about this slide here. It's still loading. So when you see this happen, isn't it uncomfortable? It's one of those really awkward on-stage moments like it'd be like spilling water on myself or something. And I just feel nervous having this in front of you all right now. It just feels like it's a bad thing is happening. I get hives. I feel kind of queasy. You don't want your users to have this experience. They'll be staring at their phone, watching this thing rotate around. They're staring at it, being hypnotized by it. It's fun for a couple of seconds. Like It's better than just nothing happening. But you want things to load and to have things happen. And a mobile phone is like a part of your body. It's like if things don't happen on the phone quickly, you get frustrated at it. Because when you go to your messaging app, or you go load up uh, whatever app you like to use for social media or something else, or play a game, it happens pretty quickly. And they're not going to say, oh, this is a website, so it's OK. I can wait for longer for that. They're going to just press that button at the bottom, wherever it is, and do something else and not see your cool content. They'll be playing Candy Crush or Fortnite or something else more you know, degrading than your excellent content, they're going to be sad like this. So if your mobile site is slow, you're going to lose users. That's not very good. As I was saying before, also part of the problem is that making a fast site can take a lot of work. Your development team is working hard to make these things happen. They're even using paper in this case. See how bad it's gotten? They're using paper to make it faster. That's never going to work. So how do you make a site that's performant? How do you do that? One way to do it, of course, is to use AMP, which is the main focus of my talk today. AMP has its good points, it's got its bad points, but I've worked on performance for a long time on the web, and this is the thing I've seen that makes it better the most often for the longest. 
people make sites faster sometimes. They go ahead and they remove JavaScript. They compress their images. They do various things to make it faster. They reduce the CSS. They take out pixels. But then the next week or month, it gets slower all over again. AMP tries to enforce faster sites on the, for the, the long term, which is why I think it's useful, although, again, it has, of course, restrictions, which are hard to abide by sometimes. But it can really make your site faster and better for user. So our topic today is how AMP is kind of becoming part of the web, the web being involved with AMP. Matt, before I discuss AMP and told you what it was, and I'm not going to do that too much. We're going to go over what it is quickly and just go from there to some things that are happening now with AMP that are kind of interesting, and web things that are happening that are kind of AMP-like for everybody. So let's go into that right now. Uh, this is my brief overview of what AMP actually is. So AMP is not a thing that makes your site look worse. AMP is not a site where you lose your design. AMP is not Googling, Google just borrowing your HTML because Google just wants it for some reason. AMP is simply a library of web components. That's the idea. HTML turned 30 uh, a couple days ago, I think it was. The web turned 30. HTML you know, came along with the web. When it was first created, it was a really great, wonderful thing. It allowed you to click on something. I guess, how do you do it? You often use arrow keys and a return button to do it. You had a mouse sometimes to do it with. You didn't tap things back then, certainly. The web allowed you to go from page to page of content on the internet pretty smoothly. It didn't have things like interactive menus, didn't have things like Twitter embeds, didn't have things like this, which is common on the web, which is a image slider, image carousel. It goes by various names, where you can swipe over here and images go back and forth. These things aren't part of the web. Neither is making a menu, for example. A lot of things you have to write JavaScript to do. AMP makes that easier because it gives you these web components. AMP adds these tags to HTML that aren't there normally. For example, in this case, AMP carousel. So this AMP carousel tag over here, with no further work, will create an image carousel like this. You specify the size of it, because one of the things that AMP does for you is makes the layout stable. It makes it so when you load a page, the things like videos, images, and ads don't pop in there and make text suddenly bounce around on your screen. It makes you declare the size of all things in advance. So the layout of the page is stable. When you load an AMP page, space is left for each image, each ad, each video embed, whatever it is, and things pop into their spaces. So it's a much smoother experience, also faster for the browser as well. So you say AMP carousel, you declare the size of the carousel, you choose some options, like responsive, for example. Responsive design is built into all AMP components. And you specify some images over here. These are AMP images. If you know HTML, IMG is a standard image tag. And replaces that with AMP IMG, which gives it control of image loading. And there's an image carousel. By the way, uh, some image carousels out there, most of them uh, will load up all the images at once, which means that the user is waiting for images to load that are off the screen entirely. And the things that are on the screen aren't visible yet. So things that are over here, they can't see it, are loading, while things are over here are loading, which makes the whole load process much slower for the user. AMP does what's called lazy loading. So it will load up the first couple of images over here. As they swipe through the images, ones that are not seen yet get loaded gradually. So it automatically does this for you to speed things up. That is AMP in like a three minute nutshell. So there's a lot more to it than that. That's the idea. It has JavaScript built in that runs these things like web components that make the developer's job easier, but also it's more restrictive because AMP really restricts you from using JavaScript wherever you want to. JavaScript can make the web slow, and AMP says the JavaScript already is part of AMP. If you want to use JavaScript, you can use it in small ways, but mostly just use the thing that AMP already has. That's changing, though, which we'll discuss in a little bit. But that's AMP quickly. So I mentioned JavaScript. So people say AMP and JavaScript are not friends, but sometimes they can be. JavaScript, which makes interactive pages, and AMP are becoming better and better friends. Let's discuss a couple of ways in which you can do this. Here's a nice animation over here showing the letters in AMP can be reversed and be upside down and form the letters PWA, which indicates these things are related in some way because the animation seems so nice and pretty, right? Do you know what PWA stands for? Progressive Web App. Yes, you're a sophisticated audience over here. Progressive Web App, what is that? It's simply a catch-all term for a set of technologies and techniques that already exist on the web that make your website on mobile phones, mobile devices, a smoother experience. Makes it more like an app, in some ways maybe even better than an app. Instead of having a web page, think about it as something bigger than a web page, an experience for the user. For example, the idea of the app shell as part of this. 
If you go to an app, you don't have the page refresh every time something happens on the screen. You have things that are constant, that are always there. So you have over here at the top, maybe a menu, maybe your company logo, maybe some colors, maybe an image, some basic stuff that defines the space your website lives in. And then content loads in there beneath that. So instead of the whole page reloading every time something happens, content just reloads into the PWA over there. It's a nice experience. It's part of the PWA idea. There's some more things that you can do. For example, adding uh, to the home screen is possible now with these. And it's seeing a full screen version of your website. So the URL bar is obscured. You just see only your website and nothing else, like it was an app. All this is possible now on the web. Also, you want to avoid the dinosaur. This little game with the dinosaur, which jumps over things that you get when you're offline on Chrome, is shockingly popular. People like these stickers a lot and t-shirts and things like that. I have a little sweatshirt with it. Anyway, um, the game is fun, but it's not a good user experience, when instead you can be taking offline content and caching it. So on those bad connections or those shaky connections, things appear there anyway. Also part of the PWA model, there's a thing called the service worker that's part of pretty much all browsers now, where it can be between the web server and the phone. It can store your content so your site works offline, which is kind of a cool thing. The idea is spreading. You may know that Microsoft has been discovering PWAs automatically and sticking those things in the App Store, which is a bold move, but they're doing this. They support PWAs 100%. Bing is finding these things and including them. And you may also have seen that Chrome is running these things desktop now on many devices, on Linux machines, on Chrome OS, also on Windows, and soon Macintoshes as well. So Chrome 70 and above, I think, will do this. You run PWAs on a full screen. So soon, desktop applications might be, in some cases, replaced by websites that resemble desktop applications. So the idea of this is spreading around the web. It sounds very unlike AMP, right? AMP is kind of for kind of maybe somewhat simpler web pages that are faster with less JavaScript and less CSS and so on. So how can that work with a PWA? Is it possible to combine these things together? You're nodding your head because it is true. They're all just web pages. AMP is web pages. Progressive Web Apps, also web pages. They can be combined together. Let's discuss that for a minute. Here's one common pattern out there we're seeing more and more, which is from AMP to PWA. So we call this sometimes start fast, stay fast. The idea is that the fastest way to get to your site or your experience is often an AMP page. You can be faster without using AMP, but it's not that commonly done. So the idea is the first click the user does, or the first navigation they do, is to an AMP page. After that, the next clicks, the next things they see, are all PWA. How does that work? There's this magical component called AMP install service worker. All things in AMP are components. This is two. AMP install service worker. Guess what? It installs a service worker. And the service worker is the thing that makes these things possible for PWAs. Here's how it looks in practice. The user finds your content via search or via an ad or via social sharing, whatever it is. The first page is AMP. They're looking at your content. They're admiring the writing. They're looking at the beautiful design. While they're doing this, the service worker installs in the background and it loads in the stuff needed for the PWA. It loads in a little bit of graphics, a little bit of JavaScript, and then the next click, the user is brought there immediately. It's already preloaded. So the second thing they do is PWA. So again, they get to your site, they get on an app page, which is fast, and the second thing they do, get to the PWA. I'm only gonna show one case study in this entire talk over here. And here's the case study. This is a uh, company called Superbulous from South Africa that did this pattern and saw remarkable metrics. Your mileage may vary, but this happens reasonably often. These uh, improvements in bounce rates, these more pages viewed per session, better conversion rates. It's a pretty useful pattern because the user gets somewhere fast. Once they're there, they get a great user experience. But there's a problem with this, though. Not the problem of this creature. I always forget this is a hamster, a guinea pig. It's a guinea pig. You ever see the show The Wonder Pets? Yeah. Ah, the Wonder Pets. Isn't it a guinea pig in The Wonder Pets? Yeah. It's a great show. <laughs> it was actually made in New York City. Uh, anyway, so the problem is with PWA that search engines are, are, sorry, web crawlers, which use web crawlers out there are kind of like users. Web crawlers go out there and request your pages, as you know, 
and then they look at what's on the pages and they index them accordingly. At PWA, though, the whole idea of PWA is that you have this app shell that gets loaded first. So all you load is this shell. And then JavaScript runs that brings in the content. It's a nice smooth experience. You have the shell there first, and then content just kind of loads into it. The problem is the first load is just HTML for the app shell. There is no content there. So the web crawler has to execute your JavaScript, or it can't see your content at all. It sees no content in some cases. So the problem is that certain web crawlers out there don't do this at all. None of them do it perfectly. Some don't even try to do it. So it's important for PWA that you have some useful content to index loaded when the page loads. Even with PWA, it's important to have that indexable content there immediately. It's an advantage of this pattern because AMP is not a JavaScript-based thing. The content's already there. So AMP is very, very easy to index. And this brings us to another pattern over here that I kind of like, which is AMP in PWA. So when AMP was first created by Google and a set of publishers, the first name that they had for it was Portable Content Format. No, sorry, Portable Content Unit, right, PCU. Part of the idea of AMP was to make content from the web reusable in various contexts and usable in other kinds of web contexts or even non-web contexts. AMP can be packaged up and reused in different kinds of ways. It can also be packaged up and used inside of PWA. Here's an example from the world. La Repubblica does this. This is a site they have where you go to the site there, you see a series of images and headlines, you tap a headline or an image, and there's an AMP article popping up. It's useful because they use AMP already. The AMP articles already exist. They repurpose those articles in this other more immersive experience. Other newspapers are trying the same thing right now. Various things are in development. While this is happening, um, well, I'll skip that over here. This is just something technical. Um, this is an example that we made over here, amp.cards. This is the demo we have. That's the URL, amp.cards. And you can see it's similar to this. It uses articles from The Guardian in this case. You go to the homepage over here and you see a bunch of pictures and headlines. You tap on a headline or a picture and see the AMP article and it appears immediately. It's a nice kind of smooth user experience. But this actually combines both these patterns together for the reasons I just discussed. When you first get to this, when you go to an article on this, on this uh, site over here, you get the AMP article. Not the PWA experience, just the AMP article. That loads very quickly. And then the AMP article is there, the service worker installs, PWA loads in the background, and your next click, you get over here. And again, for search engines, this is good because if you're a web crawler, every view is like the first view. They have no history, they have no cookies. So the first view is all they ever have. So they always get served the article with the content. It's kind of a neat pattern. And I have a long slide that explains it. I'm gonna skip this slide because it's pretty crazy looking. This is a diagram showing the whole thing, but let's not discuss this now because it seems complicated to me to discuss this right now. Do you wanna see this explained? Uh, okay, let's keep on going over here. Let's skip this beautiful diagram and go on to Another cool thing that AMP is doing, do you know what streaming is? Usually when you load a page, the whole page loads, and then when it's all loaded, it gets parsed and dealt with, and it appears on the screen. Streaming is when the page is loading, and as it loads, things automatically begin to appear as they load up. So as text loads, as images load, they appear on the screen right away. This is hard to do on the web, but there's a hack that does this, and AMP supports this as well. I put it into this demo you have over the amp.cards. If you try it in a very slow connection, you will see actually content streaming in there. It doesn't load and then appear. As it's loading, it all appears. This also is part of AMP as well. Not well known. We consider AMP to be this very simple thing, but it's full of this interesting stuff that it tries to do to make things better for the users, easier for programmers as well. It takes only one command to do this over here. I didn't have to program this stuff. It was already built into AMP. So I mentioned before this thing about AMP and JavaScript, JavaScript being the code that runs a site, and AMP restricting JavaScript. And you can use JavaScript in various ways in AMP. You can use it on your server to build your pages. You can use it, as you just discussed, in a progressive web app. But also, this will be released very soon. As Matt was saying, AMP conferences in April. So various things are being developed that aren't released quite yet. One of the things is AMP script, which is the tag that allows you to do your own JavaScript inside of AMP. This wasn't allowed before because JavaScript can be slow, but this is a more restricted way of using JavaScript. It puts it in a safe place called a worker, 
And JavaScript can still run, but it can't block things from appearing on the screen. It can't block the page load. But it can help out with user interactions. So if your developers are saying, yeah, AMP is OK, but I can't control what it does. There's web components, but I want to customize these things myself, and I can't do that. Well, now you can, because AMP script allows you to put your own JavaScript into a page. It's a way that the web is finding its way into AMP. How about AMP finding its way into the web? How is that happening? How are things from the AMP and things from the web combining together in various ways? Here's something else that I'm pretty excited about personally. I think Matt mentioned this before. So a lot of people make um, websites on WordPress. I think it's about a third of the web is WordPress. It's a giant, giant chunk of the web. And when WordPress made its first AMP plugin, it did this. You tried this before, this AMP plugin? You may have tried this before. You have tried this. <laughs> yes, I agree with your assessment. So what it did, and this is true of a lot of CMS's AMP plugins, and a lot of plugins you find out there, is you lost your entire design. It was gone. You have over here no menu. You have no company logo, no custom font. Your design is gone. All it is is the text, and then something at the bottom saying, leave a comment. This was not the idea of AMP. AMP wasn't supposed to be just kind of a worse looking version of your page. It's simpler, but it's not a great user experience, is it? You want to have them see your beautiful design and do other things you've had them do on your pages. That's no good. But it was simple, it was expedient, and it worked quickly. So now, um, after a year or so of development by Google and XWP, an agency that works on a lot of WordPress things, we have the new version of the AMP plugin, which is much, much nicer. What this does is it keeps your design. That's good, right? And it supports major themes like 2019. These themes work out of the box. And because AMP doesn't support JavaScript all the time, certain plugins won't work, but not many of them won't work. It will flag those for you and tell you how to maybe fix the things that don't work. It automatically gets your CSS to be smaller, so it will fit within AMP's constraints for CSS. It works with Gutenberg also, with Gutenberg blocks. They're all compatible. Check it out down there, wp-amp.org. Also, that bit.ly uh, short link over there is a video where I actually worked with a developer to take a site and convert it to AMP. And it wasn't that hard to do. It turned out we took this uh, site here, which is full of all these plugins, took out all the plugins. Only one actually mattered, it turned out. That one plugin required JavaScript. We did it with AMP instead, and then everything was all good. It was this kind of fancy menu that was kind of harder to do with AMP, but we did it. So it's all done now. It looks the same as it used to look. I'm pretty excited about this because I think it's one of the good use cases for AMP. People that use WordPress we may not even understand what AMP even is, but want to have faster sites that are easier to control and better for users, not full of lots of bloat from plugins adding JavaScript and CSS. This does it for them automatically, and the sites are AMP all the time. So it's a good way to make a fast WordPress site. Try it out, see what you think. Feel free to suggest changes to the people that are making this because it's pretty new. Also, a change Google is doing here with AMP is, well, I guess it isn't really Google doing this. One of the problems with AMP is that there's a cache. Things are, store, are stored on domains like Google's domain. And once in a while, you have to see a Google.com address there in your URL bar. That's kind of a yucky experience for everybody, including the AMP team. So there's a new thing coming out called signed exchanges or web packaging. The idea here is that if you make the content, it doesn't matter who serves the content. If a cache serves your content, it's still your content. So you can cryptographically sign your content. And then a browser can know this is yours and display your domain. And things work as if it was your domain, not the domain of the cache. So you can have the advantage of caches that make your site faster without losing your domain to some other strange company like Google or Bing or someone else. What else is there? This is an interesting one over here. This was announced last year. There's a lot of work happening on this now that Google Search also wants to give the AMP treatment to non-AMP pages as well. So pages that are AMP-like and that they're fast, AMP-like and that their content doesn't jump around when you go to the screen, the layout's pretty stable, you go there, things don't move around too much. If pages are fast and they have stable layout, and things that are being discussed now and being worked on now, they get the same badging as AMP on Google Search. Lightning Bolt should appear there, they get into the AMP carousel, all these things. Because again, the idea of AMP isn't to have the separate version of the web. Let's make the web faster in general. And this is how the web can have the same treatment that AMP can on Google Search. 
although it is kind of hard to make a site this fast, without using AMP, it's possible to do it. Wikipedia, for example, is very, very fast. They don't use AMP. Some more things about AMP and the web over here. There's a lot of things in this talk which I apologize for. It's kind of a grab bag of stuff with the web and with AMP. But it's kind of the interesting stuff I think we're getting to now, which is basically how AMP and the web are really working together to become, to learn from each other's lessons and become better in various ways. For example, PWA takes some time to do, it takes some writing to do. What if it was easier than that? What if you could make a PWA with just one line of code? AMP's working on that right now. It's still in development. A one line PWA. You use the tag saying, make a PWA. It will then cache things offline for you. It will, when you're on a certain page, grab the next page in the background, have a smooth transition to the next page. Transitions that'll be done smoothly. All these things are being worked on as part of this one line PWA project over here. But what if all these things happen and your site is still slow? What is the web to do? If people are out there and they're in places where they can't see your site at all because it's loading too slowly, if they're on 2G connections, on really bad connections, your site doesn't load, what can you do? Chrome is doing some things to try to combat this problem. Google Web Lite, have you ever seen this? I've seen this before because I have T-Mobile. And T-Mobile is very kind and gives me free data around the world, but on 2G. So if I travel somewhere and I have my uh, US phone, or my US SIM card, and I go to a website, I get 2G, and most sites never load. It's kind of not that great. So I've actually been traveling sometimes and seen something else pop up where the site appears and it looks a bit different. It looks a little simpler, but I can still see the content. That was Google Web Lite, it turns out. Here's an example. This is my old band site. Uh, I don't have this band anymore, but I just pulled it up. I know it's kind of a slow site. I never fixed it, made it any faster, so that's my fault. Here's how it looks. I guess that the quote there is kind of not centered, so it should be fixed clearly, but that's how it looks normally. Here it is on Google Web Lite. You can see that it's similar, but this loaded much faster because, see the image there? The image was too big, and it loaded a transcoded, blockier version of this image. It doesn't look great, but it loaded. It didn't fail to load. There's a picture there of the text in the custom font. It took a snapshot of this and loaded that instead. And the custom font at the bottom there no longer exists. It used a default font. The JavaScript didn't load up. The menu is replaced by the thing saying menu over there. So it doesn't look as nice as it did before, but it loaded. So this is Google Web Lite. It's happening across the web for very slow connections. If you don't like it, you can opt out of it instead. You can use a header in your site which says, don't do this, and we'll never do this to your pages. But again, if you're in a slower connection somewhere, it can be your only chance to see a web page is Google Web Lite. Something similar that's happening is data saver mode. You ever experienced data saver mode? No one has. You can opt in, you have seen it. You can opt in on Chrome on your phone or the Android browser on your phone. In the US it isn't that popular, but in some countries it's very popular. Data saver automatically loads less data. It will do various things. It keeps changing what it's doing all the time. You can't be as dependable what it actually does, but it might transcode your images to make them smaller. It could minify your code so it's smaller. It can compress your text. It does various things to make things load faster on your phone. It might sometimes block certain large things from loading, possibly. It might not do that. This week, Chrome announced Chrome Lite, which is a stronger version of this, where actually it will block certain things. If, you have, if it detects a 2G connection, or it detects that something's taking more than five seconds to get to what's called first contentful paint, it might take images and replace them with placeholders instead if the images are too big. It might block certain routes of JavaScript. These are kind of extreme things, but it's the only way sometimes people can view your page at all. So this is not AMP. This is other stuff, other interventions that are happening out there to make pages that are really slow, in certain cases, load faster. How the ideas from AMP are being applied to the web in kind of a different kind of way. And something else then, why isn't it easier just to make page transitions smooth? If you want to go on your site from page to page, have it load in smoothly, have a PWA style experience where the app shell is always there and content just kind of loads in gradually, it takes a lot of JavaScript to do this. The web can't do this out of the box. It can't go from page to page smoothly. But what if it could? Why couldn't it do that? 
Well, there's a new proposal called Portals that's being worked on right now in Chrome. It's a proposal for HTML standard that will permit these kinds of seamless web page transitions that don't exist currently without a lot of coding. Here's how it might look over here. Here you are on a website. Maybe you scroll up and see a product page over there, and then it kind of expands and suddenly becomes your page. This, would, this is kind of like an iframe, but it's more powerful. You could also make an AMP carousel experience where you could be on your site and flip between different pages and then choose a page quickly. Or you could have transitions happen automatically. This is being considered for AMP also, some way of making AMP pages go to AMP pages in a smoother way without the whole page load. So again, the idea from AMP and web sort of mixing together and maybe making the web better for all people and making developers' experience also easier. Finally, AMP, I said before, is web components. It's like a set of tools you can use to build a website that don't require as much coding. Should the web have this too? Should the web have these built-in things that make it easier to make things like image carousels and menus? Why doesn't the web have this kind of stuff? For the web, there aren't these kinds of things. You load all this JavaScript to make your site that's slow, it's cumbersome sometimes, but that wasn't always necessary. This is being now considered for the web with built-in modules. You're seeing this appearing in Chrome for the first time right now, where certain things that are common uses on the web that you often load JavaScript for can be built into Chrome or built into browsers in general and just load in automatically. What's next over here? Oh yeah, this is a nice one. Back to the beginning of this talk. The goal is not to restrict your content or make it look strange or something. The goal is simply to make a better web. So the web that you experience now in this room on your nice devices with good Wi-Fi can be true for all users all the time and helps your business. People will stay on your site longer, they'll do more things on your site, they'll view more ads, it's just better for users and it's better for all of us and we're kind of in this together. So if you have questions or you have comments or suggestions, please let me know. It's kind of a complicated subject, a delicate subject perhaps, but I think a really important subject to go over. And that's gonna spin, that's kind of cool. Uh, if you wanna check this out also, our new site is launching. It's now in beta but amp.dev will soon replace the various AMP sites that exist, and it will have not just documentation, but also examples, places to try AMP out. It will have templates you can use to start with building your AMP site, built-in designs, and also coursework to learn AMP, actual academic courses that can be used for trainings or in colleges or other kinds of places. Amp.dev, and that's all for me. Thanks a lot.